Welcome to Sir David Simmons, His Life in Focus. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. As always, thanks for joining us. In this week's episode, Sir David speaks of what eventually became a long and rewarding association with the people of St. Thomas. He introduces this segment by calling attention to a very sad occurrence which occasioned that association. So Monday afternoon, I remember, and I was home here. And Marie called and asked me if I heard that it was all over the registry, she was registrar. And I said, no, I tuned the radio. Yeah. So I went gone. And um, the first person who called and said, I, I, I had been a senator because I'd lost the seat in St. Philip in 81. The, first person who called and said that I should run in the by-election was Lady Adams, Tom's mother. The same evening he died, she called here and she said, you know, I offered my sympathy and so on. And she said, David, you have to run. She had a deep voice, you know. When Tom got his voice from her, obviously. David, you have to run in St. Thomas. I'm going to speak to the people up there. But she didn't need to speak because in a matter of hours, Doris Bowman, Jolly Bullard, um, Lawrence Johnson, all of them were calling and saying they had spoken to Bree and told him. But we had to have a runoff. There were other people interested in, in, in the seat. But Lady Adams had always been uh, very partial to me and Sir Grantley. It started, of course, with Sir Grantley when I was a student in England and he used to come up every spring to go to the ILO meetings in Geneva. He was a member of the Committee of Experts and he used to pass through and he stayed at the Charing Cross Hotel near Trafalgar Square there. He stayed at Charing Cross Hotel next to Charing Cross station and he would always get in touch and ask me to bring home a few of the fellas and we'd go and have some drinks with Sir Grantley. And the day after, it was my responsibility to take Sir Grantley on Charing Cross Road to a bookshop called Collets that sold socialist material. And he would go there, we'd go with him and he would buy um, the latest Fabian pamphlets or whatever. and. So, so when I came home in 68, that I'd mentioned before, I went, I went to see him and Lady Adams and they had me for lunch and so on. Uh, he was, a, he, he was a big influence in my life. The way that he, he was so humble. He's a man who had achieved greatness, but yet he was so humble. And I tried to let his example, uh, wash off on me and resonate with me. In a previous episode, Sir David reminded us that he shared his birthday with Sir Grantley Adams, who was born on April 28th, 1898. Now back to St. Thomas as he details his introduction to that parish and the by-election campaign of 1985. There was to be a runoff, and O'Brien Trotman was. There was talk about O'Brien running and, and Glenn and so on, but ultimately it came down to me. Um, but Bree gave me probably eight or nine weeks to campaign. And the day after the vote at Rock Hall, uh, social centre tonight. 
The day after, Caswell Franklin came. Caswell had been a member of the group. Caswell came here and we set off. And Caswell and I became friends from then. And he subsequently became my personal assistant. We are not as close now because he's a senator in the opposition and, he, and so on, but um, Caswell is Caswell. Anyhow, we, we did some important work campaigning. I, I found out one of the reasons that I lost the 1981 election in St. Philip North was that the voters list had been padded with people known to be sympathetic to the Democratic Labour Party but coming from other, other constituencies who voted. We had our suspicions, and when we checked back, we found that there were about 170 people who were wrongly registered. And I wrote a letter to the chief electoral officer, Mr. Dennis Smith, and complained. And he took a few months and he got back to me and he said that everything that I said in the letter was true. These people should not have voted, but he pointed out. It was my responsibility as the candidate to keep that list clean, clean it, prune it. If, if people were on the list who should not be on, I should have objected and didn't do anything like that. Still not aware of all of the nuances of politicking. But we decided for St. Thomas, we were starting on the ground. So Caswell and I, every morning, would leave here with the list and go from district to district and check. Caswell had the forms the claim forms and the objection forms. And as we came across people, we filled up the forms, and the next day he would take the forms to the returning officer. Um, and that was important because we must have done well over 600, either in claims or objections. We cleaned the list. And I won by 485 votes. God rest his soul, my opponent was Junior Rock. He just died, but he, he, he ran me very well. Uh, and it was what we picked up, too, in working on the ground, was that Tom had lost some of his popularity in St. Thomas chiefly because of people around him who were, in things they said and did, were antagonizing the constituents. He may not have known about it, I'm sure he didn't know. But people sometimes think that they're doing you a favor, but in fact, they're really um, harming your, 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 your prospects. So um, that was that, and I had a, a, a long sojourn with the people of St. Thomas, 16 years. Excellent relationship, I can't say less. One of the things I was telling you, I learned that for as great a campaigner as he was, and as careful a campaigner as he, he was, where he moved with his cards and he had the names of the constituents written on cards and all the family information and so on. Tom was never able to win Melrose or Bridgefield or Shop Hill on the main road. He would win what we call Hampon, Vaucluse Tenantry down the back. But he never won those three, I can not recall to mind now, Bridgefield, Melrose, and, and uh, Shop Hill on the main. And, um, I won all of them, twice, yeah. Not the first thing, but thereafter in the 99, in the 94 and in 99, actually won every box. And, you know, it was, I suppose, that in politics, you will hear people say to you, don't go to that house. He's a dame or she's a dame.
You don't want to talk to them. Wrong. You must go. I went to Rock's mother. I went to Rock's mother and presented myself and told her that I doubted that she would give me the vote, but she kind of said I never came and asked for it. I went. Um, you never know. It may be that the mother, yeah, is against you, but there may be two or three inside who are for you. So you, I think you should go to every house, and I, I, I tried to do that when I was campaigning. Um, but as I say, I know there were people who would, but they tried it with me, some of his canvases. Man, I don't go, I said, no, 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 no. I go into every house. Uh, yeah, but it was, um, campaigning is interesting because you learn so much about the social history of Barbados. You know, it fills a lot of gaps in your head. I, one of the things that I like to think about is what I was able to do for Forty Acre. Forty Acre was there, um, little tenantry in backwater, nobody paid it any mind at all. Nobody did anything for those people. I got the road fixed, got a proper road. I paid $3,600 to contribute to putting in water for those people. Um, Carolyn Leacock helped me raise some funds and yeah, to give the people in, 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 in 40 acre water. But you know, the pavilions and so on, they're there in the constituency. I tried to do the roads. Hopewell was a big issue in the by-election. It had been that a draw that had been neglected. And it's one of the first things I did. I got a spanking new road built at Hopewell. Many other places. Yeah. Yeah, well, I won the St. Thomas by election in May 1985. I went back to the lower house because um, up until the, the by election, I was a senator because I lost in I lost in 1981, and um, of course I. I I met Owen Arthur before, but the two of us served together in the Senate until he won um, St. Peter. And then the year after, I won um, St. Thomas. I think Owen won in 84, and I certainly won in 85. Um, the Labour Party was the government at the time that I won, Bree became Prime Minister after Tom died. And um, I was appointed Attorney General and Minister of Home Affairs just for a year because general elections were due in the following year in 1986. And the Labour Party got very badly beaten. The, the public said that the clock stopped at 24 to 3. There are 24 dams to the three of us, and of course they were quick to call us the three blind mice. Uh, but it was a daunting experience, but not one that we felt unable to cope with. And Henry became the, the leader of the three of us, and the three of us lived very closely. I suppose every day we spoke. And certainly Owen, Owen would call me every morning between half past five and six o'clock and we would talk something. Well, what was happening and what we were going to do, or what bill was coming up, or resolution, or whatever. And we always made sure that on the Monday before the sitting of the House on Tuesday, 
we would find ourselves at Barbados Labour Party headquarters at five o'clock for the parliamentary party meeting. There were the three of us and Billy and Louis in the Senate. And we would meet, but there were, there were others who would come. Not some of those who lost their seats and so on. It, you know, it needed a little time for them to recover from the shock of the defeat and the trauma and so on. But we had other people who would come and meet. If we had technical things coming up, there were people we could draw, whose, whose expertise we could draw on, and they would come. And certainly, when we were preparing for estimates that week, that we were going to be in the house debating the estimates of revenue and expenditure. On the two weekends before, we would be engrossed at the same headquarters with advisors going through the estimates in a very systematic way. So we, we, we prepared ourselves and we felt that we had a duty because even though we only got three seats, I think we got about 40 something percent of the, of the vote. Um, and we gave better than we got. Suppose all of us could talk, but the, the records will show that in two estimates, debates, the three of us spoke more hours than the 24 of them. And we weren't talking foolishness, I want to say. Um, all was going well because the election of 86 was one on the basis of what they call Richie Haynes' back raise budget. Uh, Richie in opposition and Shadow, Minister of Finance, replied to the, the budget presented by Bree uh, in what he called the alternative budget. And they were giving away everything. Uh, and of course, with public response, the population always responds to the party that is offering more to the pocketbook, pocketbook politics. And they were going to ease taxation and oh, every, everything you could think of. We don't have to go into it now. And they made these wonderful promises. Both Bree and Owen said in their speeches, this cannot work. So, when the heady people voted massively, soon after the parliament convened, Richie brought the necessary legislation to implement these promises. Right? We were smiling because we knew that the economy would be capsized. And we kept saying that to them. And then, Something was happening within the Democratic Labour Party that Mr. Barrow and Richie Haynes were not getting on as well as people assumed that they were. You know, it was a time when Richie used to be called the second most powerful man in Barbados. And after the 86 election, he went and negotiated a famous bullet loan, went to Japan and negotiated, and Mr. Barrow said, I'll tell you, we, after that election, we'd, we used to meet in the Senate chamber because the, uh, the house was being uh, repaired and renovated and so on. And so I used to sit around the Senate table and you're close. So Mr. Barrow was there at the height, and Henry was here, and I was next to Henry, and then Owen. And you, you, you could always whisper to Mr. Barra and so on. So we teased him one day, and 
because he said something that showed that he was upset with Richie for negotiating the loan. And worse to the fact, I told him not to, not to do that, and he wouldn't listen to me. So, of course, we, we were mischievous, and we say, I don't mind, I don't need a little family quarrel, because you know, you know, you know he's going to succeed you. And Sabar rose to his feet and said, well, let me tell you all something. After me, it is him, meaning Sandy, then him, meaning Philip Graves, and after that, any number could play. If you look at Hansard now, you wouldn't find that exchange. But the Nation newspaper carried it. Uh, Ezra Allen recently um, recounted it and, and uh, identified the date on which it was said. But there was a fracture in the relationship between Mr. Barrow and Mr. Sandy. For then, unfortunately, you know, We'd hardly, we'd hardly settled in after winning in 86, but Mr. Barrow died in June 87. And Sandy took over and again he and Richie didn't seem to set horses. And Richie, Richie made some overtures to us to come and join him, he was going to establish the NDP. And he said, you know, the, the people are finished with you all, you know. You all have no future. I wonder if I should tell you this story. This is really, uh, but politics was so intriguing. Richie asked to see us one evening at his house, Henry, Owen, and myself. And we agreed to talk about whether there could be any union between us. Well, for our part, we were, we were satisfied in our minds that it couldn't happen. You know, we were representing, as I said, about 40% of the people. I, and certainly the three that Richie had with him, um, Bayerborn, Peter Miller, himself, they couldn't, they couldn't represent 40%. But we wanted, to, we wanted to talk, so talk. So it was arranged that we would park in at Rockley about 8 o'clock, in the dead of night almost. And we would walk across the golf course to Richie's house at the other end of the golf course. So the three of us walked across to Richie's house. I mean, we got there, we had a couple of drinks and so on, we talked. And we felt good that we had come, we had talked. And we told him, you know, we really can't do business. We would be letting down the 40% that we represented. And he, he understood. Going back across now to our cars, across the golf course. This must be after 11 o'clock now. All of a sudden, a voice in the dead of night. Good night, Mr. Ford, Mr. Simmons, and Mr. Arthur. A watchman saw us, caught us, coming back from this meeting. It never made cocoa and flying fish or anything. This is one of the few occasions that you're hearing about it, but believe me, we, we, we laughed to ourselves and said, but Lord, we. We were sure that nobody had seen us. We pulled off this one. And all of a sudden, as we coming back to get to the car, the watchman let us know, I caught it up. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's, that's some of the intrigue that goes on in politics. Um, then, of course, there was the fracture between Richie and Sandy. That was bitter, bitter. The day that Richie spoke in the house, um, terrible, I know that. I knew that they were 
close friends from at school. But uh, the language was acerbic. Anyhow, Richie formed his party. He made sure he had four, so he commanded the, <laughs> the opposition. <laughs> and he took over and led the opposition. Huh? We smiled. In the next election, I don't think that Ginger Bourne or Peter, Peter Miller or Richard Bayer regained their seats. And we, three blind mice, were able to carry along another seven. And we had moved from three to ten. Um, and for that election, 1991, the economic forecast for Barbados was dismal. And even though Henry tried to explain to the public from the platform, they didn't listen. We said we are going to end up in serious trouble. I remember the meeting up here at Charles Road Bridge. Henry tried to get it across to the public. They won't buy it. Well, in no time we were in real trouble. You know, the foreign reserves had gone one quarter to 13 million. And um, ultimately, things got worse. And you know, by 1994, there was a lot of internecine warfare within the government of the DLP. And that is exactly where we shall leave that. Do join us next week at the same time as we continue this autobiographical journey of Sir David Simmons. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. Thanks for your time.